In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. I thought an appropriate gospel to begin a session on the source and summit of our faith in Blessed Eucharist. Before we begin to plumb the depths of this marvelous subject, the real presence of Christ in the Most Blessed Sacrament and its place in the economy of salvation, I'd like, especially for the sake of those who have come here for the first time, to review the objective of Go Deep as well as the progress we, that we've made thus far. So whenever someone asks me about Go Deep, what's that Go Deep? What's that all about? I generally will just give them the, the simple one-line answer that seems to kind of sum it all up. Go Deep is about helping ordinary Catholics grow in extraordinary holiness. It's a call, as we've seen, that we all enjoy. We're all called to enjoy the perfect intimacy with the Holy Trinity that God intended from the beginning. Whether you're male or female, priest, religious, laity, that is for everyone. We're all called to the heights of sanctity. We've also observed that there are four fundamental rules of the spiritual life. First, that our effort is necessary. We can't just put it on autopilot in the spiritual life and let God do everything for us. It doesn't work that way. We have to put forth our effort. We have to cooperate with the grace of God. So our effort is necessary, but it's also insufficient. We do need the grace of God to make any progress toward union with him. So it's about cooperating with the grace of God with our own effort. Third, we saw that suffering is part of the deal. We can't hope to progress to the summit of the mountain without enduring some sacrifice, some suffering. But the fourth rule of the spiritual life is that that suffering and all the effort we put forth in striving to reach union with God is worth it. It's more worth it than we can possibly imagine. Further, we've broken down this course into three sections. We're still in the midst, approaching the end, but in the midst of the first section, deep conversion. In this section, we've been uh, considering the means of rejecting sin habitually and practicing virtue habitually. That's what conversion is all about. It's about uprooting vice and planting virtue in its place, making way for the grace of God to operate freely in our lives and to live a life of love and relationship with him. Second, we'll be talking about a deep life of prayer. Another part of going deep in our faith and reaching that union with God is having a deep prayer life, a personal prayer life, and also immersing ourselves in the sacramental life of the church. And then finally, the third section of the program is entitled Deep Knowledge, Deep Knowledge of God, which involves both a prayerful study of God's Word, 
the truths of our faith in the magisterium, as well as the, uh, an, a greater understanding of who Jesus Christ is. All truth can be distilled down into the fact that it's not something, it's someone. Jesus Christ is the fullness of truth. So each of those three elements and all of the four rules need to be not words on a page or kind of rules on, on the refrigerator that you try and, try and check off. I've got that one down. I did that one. But they're things that we're called to really live out each and every day of our lives. And God doesn't ask us to, to move to a convent or a monastery to do so. The good news is we can do this. We can grow in heroic sanctity. We can achieve union with God right where God has placed us in the simple, ordinary circumstances of our da daily lives, right where we live. The session before last, we really kind of brought to a close the, the first couple sections of our deep conversion portion of the course. We'd been looking at um, tips to overcoming temptation, uh, tips on practicing virtue, getting rid of mortal sin, getting rid of venial sin, and we're poised to conclude the section on deep conversion with a discussion of detachment. But as you, as you uh, know, or may know, we ended the last semester by taking a, a bit of a uh, departure from the, the course outline and examining the subject of confession, the sacrament of penance. And so I thought it only fitting that in beginning this second semester this year to take some time to look at the sacrament of the Eucharist. And so we're going to uh, do that in two parts. We're going, uh, first of all, to begin tonight with um, a perspective that I think would be best summed up by analogy. If you're looking into someone's eyes, you're probably going to be looking in one of two ways, either as an optometrist would look or as a lover would look. Now, if you're an optometrist, you're looking into that person's eyes from a scientific perspective, you're looking at the cornea, you're looking at is it healthy, you're looking at um, various indicators that uh, give you some sense of scientific evidence for whatever you're looking for. If you're a lover looking in to your beloved's eyes, you're probably not looking in that way at their eyes. You're looking for beauty and you're probably looking deep into what's behind their eyes. You're looking into their heart. You're really trying to see them more for who they are. And it's in this way that we're going to begin our discussion of the Eucharist. We're going to start tonight as lovers, looking at our beloved God in this beautiful manifestation of his love for us. And we're going to start tonight by specifically looking at the Eucharist in its place in God's plan of salvation. And this is something that's really key to everything we're going to say tonight. The manner of Christ's coming and the means that he employed to save us are inseparable from his desire to leave himself for us in the Eucharist the manner of Christ's coming and the means he employed to save us are inseparable from his desire to remain with us always in the Blessed Sacrament. It really is as St. John says in his first letter, God is love. Not only is it what he does and does perfectly, but it is who he is. The entire purpose of his plan for our salvation 
aims at revealing this truth to mankind. God is love. The Eucharist is the sacrament of God's love. So tonight we will examine the sacrament of love from the perspective of love. Essentially what we're saying here is that the crib, the cross, and the table of the Lord are not disjointed elements in his saving work, but they reveal the sublime steps of God's wonderful plan to bring us once more into perfect communion with him. This is what redemption is all about, healing our relationship with God that may once again enjoy that perfect intimacy with him that he intended in the beginning. And this harkens back to the theme again of this entire series. It's what we've been driving at all along, understanding how we can cooperate with God's grace to attain union with him. It's God's will, again, for each and every one of us. By sending his only Son and the Spirit of love in the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. God himself is an eternal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he has destined us to share in that exchange. As we'll hopefully see tonight, the Blessed Eucharist is a big part of our claiming, growing in, and living this, our glorious destiny. Now, the Son of God could have worked out our salvation in other ways, but he chose from all eternity, even before the fall of Adam and Eve, to redeem us as he did, by, becoming to, by coming to us as a child, by dying on a cross, and by leaving himself to us in the Eucharist. This being the case, again, I hope to uncover and unpack this very deep truth and show not only how this is so, but also, again, the connection between the crib, the cross, and the table of the Lord, as St. Francis would say. And also illustrate that the key to understanding the why of the first two, namely the incarnation, the birth of Jesus as an infant, and the death of Christ on the cross, is to be found in the third of those three, the Holy Eucharist. Now I will say in advance that tonight's session is going to be a little bit less quote-unquote practical and a little bit more devotional than usual. And I mean that in the sense that normally I provide a lot of very measurable things that we can do to cooperate with God's grace, to be more open to his work within us, to be holy as he is holy. But that doesn't mean that tonight's session on, this, on God's amazing, incalculable love for us in the sacrament is not practical. It is intensely practical. For in better assimilating these truths, which again are not something but someone, and by relating to them, we will better relate to him, the person of Jesus Christ. I pray that as we progress in this session and after this session, as you reflect on it, that these truths of our faith will less be facts or doctrines only and will more put us in contact with, again, in relationship with him who is the way, the truth, and the life. This is the purpose of all theological study, relationship with Christ. So again, as I said, or as St. John said, God is love. We also saw from the catechism that God is an eternal exchange of love. As we've said before, true love is diffusive of itself. It longs to be given away. God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
being the perfection of love in himself, didn't need more to love, but he desired more to love. And so he conceived of the whole of creation, the angels, the earth, and everything in it. And finally, he created man. Man is the summit of God's creation because he's created in God's own image and likeness. God created each and every human being with a body, with senses, like other creatures, but with more than this. Man is unique in creation in that he has an immortal soul with its three faculties of intellect, memory, and will. Intellect being the capacity to think, to reason with our minds, memory, and of course the will, the heart, the seat of decision, whereby we choose to do good or we choose to abuse our free will to do evil. These three faculties allow us to enjoy the vast and varied beauties of the created world which were made by God specifically for man to serve his needs and inspire him to love the God who is the giver of all these varied gifts. St. Augustine said, Heaven and earth and all things tell me to love you. My Lord, whatever I behold on earth or above the earth, all speak to me and exhort me to love you because all assure me that you have made them for the love of me. And yet as we know, even though God had made us the stewards of creation, man defied and rejected God's love through sin. Still, God did not take back his love. Century after century, he pursued us until in the fullness of time, surpassing the greatest lengths imaginable to secure our affection, he sent us his only son, his very self, to atone for our sin and to reconcile us with him. And enjoy the intimacy with him which he had originally intended. As someone once said, he paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. St. Lawrence Justinian says that the intense charity of the word of God surpasses all maternal and filial love. Neither can human words express how great his love is to each one of us. And St. John Chrysostom asserts that God has loved every individual man with the same love with which he has loved the whole world. Just ponder that thought for a short while. He loves each man separately with the same measure of charity with which he loves the whole world. In other words, if you were the only person after the fall of Adam and Eve to ever have lived, God would have come to save you in the same way that he came to save all mankind from Adam and Eve to the end of time. How can one begin to grapple with such a fact, with such a glorious truth, the immensity of, of the love of God, who having created th everything out of nothing and sustaining it all in being, abandoned the immeasurable bliss of eternity and humbled himself to become a man a humble child, no less, to grow in poverty and obscurity to adulthood, only to be rejected, abused, tortured, and executed by the very creatures he was coming to save. St. Ambrose gives a good analogy to try to take a stab at reaching the greatness of God, the immensity of of the greatness of God. He said, to say God is greater than the heavens, than all kings, all saints, all angels, is to do an injury to God. Just as it would be to an injury to a prince to say that he was greater than a blade of grass or a small fly. God is greatness itself, and all greatness together 
is but the smallest atom of the greatness of God. And that same God chose to enter time and space as a tiny, poor, and helpless infant, shivering in a cold stable for the salvation of you and for me. Reflecting on this, St. Bernard of Clairvaux adds, See, power is ruled, wisdom instructed, virtue sustained, God taking milk and weeping, but comforting the afflicted. And St. Ambrose adds, He is a little one that you might be a perfect man. He is bound in swaddling clothes that you might be unbound from the fetters of death. He is on earth that you might be in heaven. It is here that in the stable in Bethlehem that we encounter the first question of the method that God employed to save us. Did God have to become an infant to become man, to redeem mankind? Now, your initial reaction might be, well, of course. How are you born into the world without being born of woman? And if Jesus were born of woman as a man, that would be problematic for Mary, to say the least. What other option did he have? Well, one might ask, has no other man in history been made man by not being born of woman? Adam. God being God could have come to be man to save us as Adam did. He could have become incarnate. He is the new Adam. He could have become incarnate as a full-grown man. St. Alphonsus de Liguori, St. Francis de Sales, and other saints in reflecting on this question have observed this very fact. But they also observed that God desired to become man as an infant through Mary that he might force more forcibly win the hearts of men to his own. God desires more to be loved than to be feared. Hardly anyone, I would, I would hasten to say, no one fears a newborn infant, or very few to say the least. When we see an infant, normally our hearts are moved to great love. And God used this fact in his plan to save us. There's another fact to which the manner of Jesus' coming testifies. It testifies to his desire to manifest his limitless love for us by remaining with us always in the Blessed Eucharist. This desire of Almighty God is foreshadowed both in the city of his birth and in the manner of his birth, namely becoming man as a child. First, how does the city of Jesus' birth relate to his desire to give himself to us in the Blessed Sacrament? Bethlehem means city of bread. Also, as an infant, where was Jesus laid to rest in the stable? A manger. What's a manger for? It's for feeding the creatures that are housed in the stable. So too did Jesus, even as a newborn babe, long to feed us, his poor creatures, with the bread of his body and the wine of his blood. Why, perhaps, was he born in the stable? Well, man, in forsaking his free will and sinning against God, acted without the reason that he was given, which set him apart from the animals. And so you might say that that location gave reference to the fact that he was lifting our nature back from uh, the animal state to its original dignity as man and male and female. And so the fact that Jesus chose to come to us as an infant can truly be seen as a foreshadowing of the gift of his body and blood and the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. 
Another fact which illustrates the point is that a grown man has the capability to go where he pleases, but a baby cannot. He's placed here or there and is completely at the mercy of those who care for him. So great is the love of God for man that Jesus chose to be so as an infant and to remain so for all time in the Eucharist, wherein he's made manifest on the altar, received into our bodies, or adored in the tabernacle of the monstrance, without any freedom to take himself here or there. So humble, so loving is our God, that to remain with us, he abandons the freedom of his sacred humanity completely into our hands. As we know, not only did Jesus choose to come to us as a little child, but he also chose as the means of expiation for our sins to suffer throughout his life on earth and to die a most horrible death. What is astonishing as anything as we've heard so far is the fact that according to St. Alphonsus, it was not absolutely necessary for Jesus to suffer and die for us in order to reconcile us with God. Were Jesus to pour forth but a single drop of his blood or to shed one tear for our salvation, this drop of blood, this tear shed by a God-man would have been sufficient to save a thousand worlds. So why suffer? Why shed every drop of blood and die on a cross? God is love. It is as the great Roman orator Cicero said, two things make us know a lover, that he does good to his beloved and that he suffers torments for him. And this last is the greatest sign of true love. St. John Chrysostom goes even further than St. Alphonsus and says that but a single prayer of Jesus would have been sufficient to redeem us but it not, would not have been sufficient to show us the extent of the measureless love that God has for us. As he says, that which sufficed to redeem us was not sufficient for love. Because God loves us so much and knows that what will give us the greatest joy in this life and the next is to love him. He doesn't need our love, but he knows that we need his love. He knows that what's best for us and will bring us to perfect joy is to give him all our love. He desired to be loved by us for this reason. And therefore he did everything that he could, even to suffer unto death for, on our behalf, that we might love him. In this also, Jesus reveals that there was nothing more that he could do to make us love him. Again, St. Alphonsus says, he willed to pour out all his blood. He willed to lose his life in a sea of sorrows and contempt to make us understand the great love which he has for us and to oblige us to love him. To what does the love of Christ impel us, as St. Paul says, but to love God with all our hearts? Reflecting on the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, St. Augustine said, O oh, marvelous thing, to see the judge judged, to see justice condemned, to see life dying. St. Bernard adds, O oh, power of love, the supreme God of all is made the lowest of all. Who has done this? Love. Love forgetting its dignity powerful in its affections. And this line is, oh, love triumphs over divinity. Love triumphs over divinity. Even more astounding than this, that God would come to die for love of us, is what St. Paul relates in Romans 5, 7 to 8. Only with difficulty does one die for a just person, though perhaps for a good person 
one might even find the courage to die. But God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And from St. Thomas of Villanova, Lord, who will ever be able to understand even the slightest degree of the immensity of your love in having loved us miserable worms so much that you choose to die even upon a cross for us? Oh, how this love exceeds all measure, all understanding. And yet there is another layer of truth in why Jesus chose to die for our salvation, and it involves the Eucharist. Not only has God loved us so as to be born as a child, to become man to save us, to suffer and die to save us, choosing a means which most revealed how fathomless his love is for us, but he desired to give us a supremely efficacious means of remembering his great love. And not only that, he desired in the process a means of becoming one with him, body, soul, and spirit. To this end, he did not give us a mere token or relic, but his own body, his own blood, his very soul and divinity in the most blessed sacrament of the altar, the Holy Eucharist. He did not have to die to save us, but he did have to die to give us his body to eat and his blood to drink in the Holy Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist is a meal. It's a wedding feast. It's a banquet. But it is first and foremost a sacrifice. In order for a meal to be possible, something has to die. If you're eating bread, it is as Jesus said, unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If it's a hamburger you're eating, the cow has to die. You cannot have any meal without sacrifice. So in order for Jesus Christ to give us his flesh to eat and his blood to drink, he had to die. And this he did not only to win for us eternal salvation, but again to reveal to us the boundless depths of the divine love for each and every one of us individually and to be one with him always, body, soul, and spirit. In John Paul II's apostolic letter on the mystery and worship of the Eucharist, he says the Eucharist is above all else a sacrifice. If separated from its distinctive sacrificial and sacramental nature, the Eucharistic mystery simply ceases to be. And the Catechism says, the sacrificial character of the Eucharist is manifested in the very words of institution. This is my body, which is given for you. And this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And the Eucharist Christ gives us the very body which he gave up for us on the cross, the very blood which he poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Thomas Aquinas called the Eucharist the sacrament of love, the pledge of love. He said, it is as if our Redeemer in leaving us this gift has said, O souls, if you ever doubt my love, Behold, I leave you myself in this sacrament. With such a pledge, you can never again doubt that I love you and love you to excess. That which the mind of man could never have anticipated, never imagined, Christ Jesus, our sweet Lord, has accomplished out of his supreme love and desire to be one with us, truly one with us, now and always. The Blessed Eucharist is the crowning glory of the triple witness of God's love for man. First, Jesus became man, a helpless babe, cold and poor. Second, he chose to suffer and die to effect our salvation. And finally, he left himself for us in the Holy Eucharist to be one with us forever and always, to sustain us, to nourish us, and to give everlasting witness of his love for us. 
St. John Chrysostom said, To that Lord on whom the angels even dare not fix their eyes, to him we unite ourselves, and we are made one body, one flesh. I think the most simple and profound statement I've ever read from a saint on the extent of the love of God for us in the Eucharist comes from St. Augustine, who said, Although omnipotent, he could give no more. Although all-powerful, God who created all things and sustains all things is powerless to do more to reveal his love for man to man. And with what longing does Jesus desire to come to us in Holy Communion? He said to his apostles, I have greatly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. St. Lawrence Justinian remarked that these are words of most burning love. And they also apply to us. They indicate the burning desire Christ has to be one with us, each and every one of us, in Holy Communion. He so desires to be one with us in this blessed sacrament that he commands us to receive him for our good and in order that we might attain eternal life. Remember what he said in the Gospel I read at the beginning, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. We heard a good deal in our last session from St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, the Apostle of Divine Mercy, to whom our Lord appeared frequently. She heard this from our Lord on one occasion. My daughter, do not omit Holy Communion unless you know well that your fall was serious. Apart from this, no doubt must stop you from uniting yourself with me in the mystery of my love. Your minor faults will disappear in my love like a piece of straw thrown into a great furnace. Know that you grieve me much when you fail to receive me in Holy Communion. And why does Jesus command us to be united with him in the sacrament? Why is he grieved when we neglect to receive him in the Eucharist? St. Dennis said that love always sighs and tends toward union. Love always sighs and tends toward union. And St. Thomas Aquinas says likewise, he said, lovers desire of two to become one. Jesus longs to be united with us in this way, in the Holy Eucharist. I hope you'll forgive a lengthy quote from St. Uh, uh, Alphonsus de Liguori. I thought it was a very beautiful kind of summary of what we've been saying. He says, This is what the infinite love of God for man has done, that he would not only give us himself in the eternal kingdom, but even in this life would permit men to possess him in the most intimate union by giving them, them himself whole and entire under the appearance of bread in this sacrament. He could not satisfy his love by giving himself to the human race by his incarnation and by his passion, dying for all men upon the cross, but he desired to find out a way whereby he might give himself entirely to each one of us in particular. And for this end, he instituted the sacrament of the altar in order to unite himself wholly to each, and St. Francis de Sales says, In no other action can the Savior be considered more tender or more loving than this, in which he annihilates himself, so to say, and reduces himself to food in order to penetrate our souls and unite himself to the hearts of his faithful. And then finally from St. Bernardine of Siena, the gift of Jesus Christ to us as our food was the last step of his love. Since he gives himself to us in order to unite himself wholly to us, in the same way as food becomes united with him who partakes of it. 
Now, what are the fruits of Holy Communion? What transformation can we hope for when we receive God into our bodies? And the Catechism gives us a list of them. Holy Communion separates us from sin. It strengthens our charity. It gives us the gift of wiping away venial sins. It revives our love, enables us to break our disordered attachments. Through the Eucharist, we are united more closely to Christ and preserved from future mortal sins. This sacrament inflames our souls with divine love and draws us into greater union with Almighty God. Through it, we become more and more like him whom we receive. The more we receive Jesus, the more worthily we'll receive Jesus. And the more we will truly become what we receive. That should be our prayer before every Holy Communion. Lord Jesus, help me to become what I receive. The living presence of God on earth. To be so one with Jesus that we become, as St. Teresa said, his hands, his feet to all the world. Jesus said, I have come to light a fire on the earth. How I wish the blaze were ignited. Where does Jesus enkindle such a blaze on the earth? In our hearts. He does so with the very fire of his divine love in the most blessed sacrament. St. John Chrysostom says that the most holy sacrament is a burning fire so that when we leave the altar, we breathe forth flames of love which make us objects of terror to hell. Demons should fear us after Holy Communion. And again from St. Faustina, all the good that is in me is due to Holy Communion. I owe everything to it. I feel that this holy fire has transformed me completely. Oh, how happy I am to be a dwelling place for you, O Lord. My heart is a temple in which you dwell continually. And after having reflected on the magisterium of the church and many of the writings of the saints, what is the constant theme that we hear? Union, union, union. The Eucharist is a marvelous means, a miraculous means of our union with God, a sacramental union with God. As we heard, the more we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, the more we become a living temple for God on earth, the more we will be transformed into his image and likeness and radiate his love in this sacrament to everyone we encounter. This is the way we transform the world. In the entire plan of salvation, conceived in the heart of Almighty God, this was the focal point. It is the focal point. Love. God is love. And it's revealed most particularly in the Holy Eucharist. Now if you recall, following the resurrection of our Lord, the Gospel of St. Luke, we hear of Jesus meeting some disciples on the road to Emmaus. And at first, the disciples didn't recognize our Lord. But they pleaded with this man who opened the scriptures for them to stay with us. How did that man answer their prayer? How did he reveal himself to them? In the breaking of the bread. Jesus stays with us. He remains with us always in the Holy Mass, in the Holy Eucharist. So let us then apply ourselves to cooperating with God's grace. As we've said from the beginning, to uproot sin, to plant virtue in its place, in order to make a more fertile soil in which to sow the power of this great sacrament. And let us also meditate, as all the saints have, on the love of God in this great sacrament. 
and his magnificent plan for our salvation, of which this is the final chapter. I'd like to close with a passage from St. Francis of Assisi. This is from a letter that he wrote to the entire Franciscan order. I think it offers us a, a beautiful and fitting close to this presentation on the Eucharist. We would profit immensely by reflecting on his words, keeping in mind that this is the man who bore the wounds of Christ on his body. He said, let the whole man be seized with fear. Let the whole world tremble and rejoice when Christ, the Son of the living God, is upon the altar in the hand of a priest. O most wondrous height and stupendous honor, O sublime humility, O humble sublimity, that the Lord of the universe, God and Son of God, thus humbles himself that for our salvation he hides himself under an ordinary morsel of bread. Behold the humility of God and pour out your hearts before him. Humble yourselves that you may be exalted by him. Hold back nothing, therefore, of yourselves for yourselves, that he may receive you wholly, who gives himself entirely to you. <laughs>